course, the next to the last lecture in this uh, year's lecture series. Uh, and uh, the last lecture will take place uh, next month, uh, right, December 2nd, uh, excuse me, November 2nd. Uh, the lecture will be entitled William Bingham the Second Philanthropist. Uh, and the uh, lecture will be our uh, oh, executive yes, director, yes, Stanley yes. Howe. The lecture will take place at the Bingham House up at the end of Broad Street. A uh, very appropriate location for this lecture. Stanley uh, has traveled recently to Cleveland and is ready to tell us lots about Mr. Bingham's life uh, here in, in Bethel and elsewhere. Uh, before moving on to tonight's uh, program, I'd welcome any announcements from uh, from the audience, anyone here have anything they'd like to announce? Okay. Uh, without any uh, further ado, then I would like to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, uh, a resident of uh, the town of Rumford, my, my hometown, uh, which this year, of course, is celebrating the 200th anniversary of its incorporation. The town was incorporated in the year 1800. There's lots and lots of events going on. Uh, Linda McGregor is here tonight. She is the uh, project director of the Rumford Bicentennial Oral History Project. And she'll be telling you a bit about a wonderful exhibit that uh, her group put together. She's also the author of a forthcoming book that I hope you'll all want to purchase uh, <laughs> called, uh, called Rumford Stories. I've just read a draft of the introduction and the first uh, five chapters. It's excellent. It's really going to be a very interesting book on the town of Rumford. I think a real a collectible. So I hope you'll all take advantage of the order form that we have here tonight. So without any further ado, I hope you'll all join me in welcoming tonight's uh, speaker, Linda McGregor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. And uh, before I get into my little very informal chat um, about the project. I want to thank Randall and Stanley for their wonderful support and to let you all know that on my first time out in March 1999, visiting with folks from the Maine Humanities Council, trying to get a little money to get started, uh, when I said I had a letter of support from the Bethel Historical Society, Dorothy Schwartz said, they're so wonderful. And she likened your organization, get this, to the Smithsonian, and very favorably. So, <laughs> I, am I am honored to be here. Um, <clears throat> here's what I'm going to tell you and talk about. First of all, I'm going to tell you a very little bit about me so you can figure out why in the world I'm involved in this project. Um, and secondly, I want to describe to you the, all the components briefly again. I want to talk a little bit about the exhibit. I want to tell you about the book, which I've been having such a wonderful time putting together and in the process to tell you a little bit about how I did the oral history interviews. Uh, then I want to read a little bit to you from some sections of the book that I think you might find it fun. I won't be too long on any of this, and I hope at any time that you have a question, don't wait till the end, just pop your hand up. Let's be real informed, and uh, I will be grateful for that. I don't need to put my glasses on to tell you who I am, um, I'm not only not from here, I'm not from there either. Um, I am from <laughs> away. Uh, but my husband, Jim, <clears throat> uh, both his parents were from here and uh, from families who've been here for a very long time. And we, over, uh, over 37 years of being married, have spent as much time in Rumford uh, and the area as we could. And about three years, almost three years ago, uh, we had made the decision to become permanent residents of Rumford Point. It was a wonderful decision. Um, and, and we've been having a wonderful time. But I must say, it is a very different thing to live in a place and to visit in it. And so, of course, my knowledge, especially being involved in the Oral History Project, has deepened and broadened greatly over three years. Um, <clears throat> when we got here about three years ago, um, there were a couple of things going on about Rumford. One was a very positive thing, and that was the launch <clears throat> with a $10 gift from the parent knock to launch the um, River Valley Healthy Communities Coalition to address health issues in the River Valley area. 
It has been thriving, and I've been very grateful to be a part of that organization. Again, a way of learning about the town, but also proud to see the progress, the positive progress that's being made. Unfortunately, at about the same time, just about three years ago, and some of you may have noticed it, um, the Portland Press Herald did a series of articles on what they characterized as the worst mill town in the state of Maine with probably the highest rate of alcoholism and drug abuse. Now, we have our problems in Milford, but it is hard to think that they are worse than a lot of other small towns. Set that aside, um, what was going on in public meetings and gatherings was you could feel the kind of self-deprecating attitude that people of Rumford had toward their town, and even therefore, I would think, to themselves. They were angry about that series. And in a way, I think it did some good because I think it made people angry enough to think they wanted to make some changes. <clears throat> so when March 99 rolled around, and I went to the, Boston, to the Rumford Library of Boston, where I used to be, um, and proposed doing an oral history project, the purpose of that project was already very clear. And that purpose has been twofold. One, to help the people of Rumford appreciate themselves better, to improve the town's self-esteem. And the second is to improve the town's image beyond its borders. You don't have to go very far to get an idea of Rumford's poor image. I was in Prince Pharmacy one summer day and there was a lady who was a tourist standing right in front of me, and she said to the nice young woman cashier, Rumford's close by here, isn't it? Should I go see it? Answer, huh, I never know. I don't go near that place. It's nothing but a smelly mill town. So um, and when I talked to the people at the uh, Maine Humanities Council, so complimentary of your organization, people said, isn't that um, the smelly uh, mill town with all the alcoholism? <laughs> so there's proof enough no, that we have an image problem. Um, and so the project purpose was clear from there. The project itself has three components, and one is rather quiet, and I'm only bringing, I'm not going to go into great detail, but the long haul impact, positive impact for the town of this oral history project resides, I believe, in the school district. And there are teachers um, working with the curriculum coordinator to integrate materials and even some uh, techniques, uh, techniques is a little fancy, um, into local history studies in the schools in SAB 43. And I think that's very important. It's not very glamorous right now, but it's important. Um, when I uh, had a little help from the Humanities Council, um, had the support of the Bethel Historical Society, had the approval of the Rumford Public Library to serve as sponsor and fiscal agent, and then the Historical Society came along uh, to be the co-sponsor of the Oral History Project. We began right away with an advisory committee. Now, this is the kind of nuts and bolts stuff I don't want to spend too much time on, but the advisory committee, um, you could understand, serves some important functions. First of all, when the exhibit came out and the decisions had been made about what oral history subjects to include in the exhibit and then in the book, I said to my friends, now if I get run out of town, you're going to have to run with me. <laughs> so there was that. But more important and really the most important work that they have done, besides their wonderful input and feedback and, and you know constructive criticism and so on, uh, was last summer, in the summer of 1999 helping to establish criteria for <clears throat> whom we should interview for the project, and also um, then helping to brainstorm a list. We came up with this group uh, with a list of over 90 subjects and organizations who ought to be represented in the project, if possible. In the end, I conducted 81 oral history interviews, and they involved more than 100 people because I interviewed a group of five retired nuns of the Order of St. Crepien, and husbands and wives, and, and so on. So that, that swelled the numbers a little bit. Let me check my notes here with my glasses on so I don't lose my own track here. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on fundraising, because 
you folks know how to do that even better than I do. <laughs> and, uh, but suffice to say that I have spent a good deal of time and with a lot of help over the last year and a half raising the money we needed to bring the project forward. Um, with the um, advisory committee's assistance and talking to anybody who would talk to me, um, we made the decision, which was a flip of what we had first intended, um, to do the photography exhibit that opened July 2nd, Nan and Rumford at the fire station, before the publication of the book. I originally had it the other way around. In fact, originally, I hadn't even planned on doing a photography exhibit, thinking of a book, a school program. But when I went to the Rumford Library, uh, the wonderful Joyce uh, Wanger, our reference library until last Friday, we shall miss her, pulled this book off the shelf, and I'd be glad for you to have a look at it. Um, this is a book that Mark Silver and others did for the Sumner uh, Bicentennial. You look as if maybe you, you're familiar with it. Um, I connected with Mark Silver 24 hours after I first saw this book. Um, his, his photography skills are exceptional. He's really brilliant. And um, we have worked very well together, and that made the exhibit seem a reasonable, a good thing to do and to have it in tandem with the town's big bicentennial parade mm -hmm. also made a lot of sense. So here it was, the opening day on July 2nd, and um, we were, Rob Cameron opened our program. Um, we, had, we had probably 15 volunteers setting up the exhibit at six o'clock in the morning. And there's one nice thing about Rumford, you can get volunteer help like that, and they never let you down. Um, and folded it down and reopened it in the municipal auditorium. Um, I'm going to tell you what's in the exhibit, but before I do, I want to remember to say to you that if you haven't been over to Rumford to see the exhibit, I encourage you to do so. We're very proud of it, and um, I certainly don't take credit for it all by myself because the photographs, as you will see, are stunning. Don't you think, Stan? Don't yeah. you think they're really fun? Um, and I'm so pleased because one of our aims, you'll remember, was to ensure that the image of the town got put out in a more positive and balanced way beyond Rumford. So, early in the new year, um, our Where's Rumford exhibit will be on display at the Muskie Archives at Bates uh, College. So we're real pleased about that. But what pleased me almost as much is that Historical Society members and people at the library have been getting these grumpy calls saying, I thought that was our exhibit. <laughs> well, it is. It is Rumford's exhibit, but it's a good thing. You know, I think, that's, I think that attests to the connection that, that the exhibit has made with, with the folks who come to see it. So I encourage you. Um, we're probably going to leave the exhibit in a municipal auditorium right through November. It's Monday through Friday, business hours 8 to 4. If you want to take the elevator, use the rear entrance on River Street. Um, the exhibit itself, again, in brief, consists of 71 photo portraits like these you see, or can see, um, by Mark Silver of oral history interview subjects. In addition, there are probably 30 historical objects, photographs, maps, uh, a wonderful broadside that Hugh Chisholm and his crowd put out promoting opportunities in Rumford. That came from the society here, um, as well as a wonderful little lithograph of, of Rumford Falls, uh, about 1859. Um, the, the object of the exhibit was to expand people's thinking about what Rumford really is. It's a long time ago that Randy Bennett groused at me. He said, you know, Rumford Falls is what they call that. <laughs> Rumford's big, and Rumford is big. It's 50,000 acres. That's big. Washington, D.C. is about 60,000 acres, and Acadia National Park, if I remember my numbers right, is about 40. So Rumford's big. So, the or so when you walk through the exhibit in the way I hope you will, you'll start, make believe, as if you were in Rumford Corner, the original settlement, and you'll wend your way in a very crooked path through North Andover and then back through Rumford Center, um, in through East Rumford, away the Virginia, um, on up the spruce, down by the Swift River, the flats, the island, the uh, Strathglass Park, Franklin Street, um, over the bridge, the Memorial Bridge, the island, Smith Crossing, and then back ultimately to Rumford Corner, Abbott's Mills, 
uh, via the South Rumford Road. So that's the idea, is to get people to think, oh, this is, this is Rumford, and, and it's big, and it's beautiful. Um, and it's various. One of the things that I'm really pleased about, and it'll be in the book and it's in the exhibit, is that the Maine State Department of Transportation Special Services, blah, 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 made a new map of Rumford. I don't think that there's been a new map of the town of Rumford, maybe for as many as 40 years, and it's a good map. It's accurate, it's, it's easy to look at, and I notice that people really do take time and find their street and stuff like that. So if you get down, you'll see that, or when the book comes out, you will see that. Um, I want to talk more, take more time <coughs> on the book that will be out within the next four to six weeks. Um, the book is called Rumford Stories, and it contains stories um, of the same 71 people whose photographs are in the exhibit. And how the stories are put together, I should back up and tell you a little bit about this. Um, when I did the oral history interviews, and typically they would be one and a half to two and a half or three hours, and Eddie Colby took four. Um, some other people took even longer, but typically the transcriptions that three very talented people did of those tapes, and that is hard work if you've ever done it. You spend two hours at least for every one of tape. Um, and those transcriptions run approximately 45 pages each on average. What I've done in sort of knitting together the stories of these 71 people is you might find a theme you remembered and really wanted to include on page three, but it's not picked up again until page 27. So the, the real labor is knitting these stories together in a logical way. Um, also, and this is perhaps more important to me than it is to other people, trying to hold on to the oral history, you know, that people were talking, not writing compositions for high school. Everybody in the world, including me probably, wants to sound like Winston Churchill, when, you know, no matter whether they've spoken the sentences, which very few of us do in perfectly constructed English sentences. So there's a tension there. Um, and that was a very time-consuming but a deeply satisfying task. So the book will have those 71 stories. Uh, Randy alluded to um, historical essays. There is one longer, fairly chronological um, history of Rumford that opens the book. Then the stories, the 71 stories, are divided among seven sections. The first section is agriculture. The second section is small business and the island. The third is um, forestry and the mill. And I almost got lost here because I didn't think I would be interested and the logging camp stories and the literature is just so wonderful to read. I'll mention a book a little bit later uh, that, that you may like to get from, from the library and read. Really fantastic. Anyway, so I thought I would do that. Um, <clears throat> here's a catch-all one, but they do link together pretty well. Law, um, government, medicine, and social services. So that's another section. Education and the arts. Um, everyday life. Um, <coughs> in which I have more opportunity than elsewhere to address it, an aspect of the history that means a lot to me, which is women's roles in, in history. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, too. And finally, the last section, section seven, is sports and the out of doors. If you know anything about Rumford, you know this town is crazy about sports. <laughs> and there are some wonderful stories. And of course, the Chisholm Ski Club and, and other outfits, the Snowshoe Club will be covered in those sections. Now, are you following me? Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK. Uh, the one thing I hadn't planned on doing, but I'm very grateful to my copy editor, and I have a wonderful one, for saying, you know, you've got to have notes in this book. You have to really name the sources. Uh, it won't be footnotes at the bottom of each page, because that'll drive you nuts. But the end, at the end of each of the essays, there will be notes, so people will know where the material came from. Um, the, the Rumford stories, the object there, is the, is the same thing as for the exhibit and the school program, with a little bit more. The book will really be something tangible, of course, that people can have and we hope cherish for a very long time. 
the book can go to California, it will, and Alaska, and I've just been thrilled at where the orders come from and, where, and fascinated where Rumford Arts have landed up. Um, I think what is, is perhaps special about this forthcoming book, Rumford Stories, is that to my knowledge, and certainly at least for Rumford, there is no other history that is written from the perspective of individual human beings. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it, but when you think of John Lane's book, uh, you think of the Oxford story, which was put out by Boise Cascade when they owned the mill. Um, even Stuart Martin, um, my husband's uncle. Uh, these books are very much from one perspective or another. Stuart's great interest was in the founding families of Rumford. Um, when John Lane wrote his book, and it's excellent, the pages are loaded with good data and hard facts um, that are very useful to me. Um, but he was working for the Rumford Falls Power Company in the Public Relations Department. So <coughs> all these books have perspectives. Um, and our book, I think, is, is broader. And I say our book um, advisedly. Now, how many of you know the history of Rumford? You're going to get the shortest form. <laughs> Gay does. Randy and Stan do. I'm going to give you the shortest form imaginable because you can read the book when it comes out. Um, the story of Rumford begins with the very complicated and drawn out adventures of these sufferers who had lost out in a boundary dispute on land deals, um, a dispute that went on between um, New Hampshire and Massachusetts and what turned out to be Concord and Bow. Uh, their grievances, you know, stretched over a very long period of time, were ultimately remedied by grants uh, of land in what was to become Rumford. Uh, for reasons unknown, perhaps Indian raids, I don't know, um, I'm not sure from reading Randy, um, Bethel uh, illustrated history, the first settler in Pen New Pentecook had first bought land up here in Bethel, 400 acres I think it was, and he sold that in 1775, and after he went back home to Massachusetts and after they hid out in New Gloucester from the Indians for a while, um, he finally settled in about 1783 in what is now Rumford Corner. That was Jonathan Keyes. It was 17 years later that the town of New Pentecook was incorporated <coughs> as Rumford. The 19th century rolled on and a lot of things happened. People farmed, people left for the gold rush, they went to Aroostook County, all kinds of things went on, but nothing was equal to the arrival of Hugh J. Chisholm in 1882. Every book I've read has something of the same version of this story, but my favorite one begins, wrapped in buffalo robes and riding in a horse-drawn sleigh, Chisholm first viewed the falls, and there it goes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some folks today and yesterday say he was a very canny man, and that's undeniable. Some say cunning, and I think that too. Um, he bought land and water rights along the river and all the repairing rights so that he could establish his little empire. I say little because compared to some of the robber barons, this was small potatoes, but it worked fine for Chisholm. Um, he started a power company. Several paper companies started up. Details later, he bought a railroad, the old Buckfield line. He uh, established a real estate holding company. He and his lieutenants, and they're really called lieutenants, you know, Pettengill and Bisbee and some of the other guys, controlled everything. And what interests me most of all for today's Rumford is that their sometimes wonderfully paternalistic management control of the town, I believe, exists today. You can still, in talking to people, there's still an attitude that, that once you've been into this history is suggestive of that past. I think it's changing. I think that's good. But um, it's, definitely, it's definitely there. Um, I face some challenges in writing the historical essays, um, but I've greatly enjoyed doing them. One of those challenges is that there aren't all that many local histories. You read pretty much the same material in Stuart Martin, as in John Lane, as in William Lapham, as in Daniel Gould, who's fun to read. Um, and I greatly enjoyed the McKenna <laughs> Bennett notes to that last publication. Um, an exception in this sort of string of 
pretty much the same information, even the same anecdotes, um, is uh, Peter McKenna, who wrote this as his master's thesis, I believe, his wonderful Hugh J. Chisholm's Magic Town. And I think the reason, uh, there are several reasons that that's much more fun to read in a way. And one is that he had a very focused subject. He was talking about Chisholm and how he you know, developed his power base and exercised his, his power in the town over time. But it's interesting in part because McKenna had done some oral histories. And for example, and he uses those, he also uses a lot more newspaper clippings and, and the kinds of things that I've tried to reach out to. Um, and he, he made some really good points. And one example is that um, he, would, he devotes some good space to Waldo Pettengill, who bought up all these lands uh, along the river for Chisholm. And um, he had interviewed a contemporary of Waldo Pettengill's, who said something like this. I'm not trying to give you the exact quote. He said, yeah, I remember that guy. He could squeeze a nickel blue. Pettengill had a reputation. <laughs> no, but you, know, you can't get that out of Lean or some of the other things. I have noticed, and I, I'm both touched um, and sometimes frustrated by a, wonder, a beautiful protectiveness, uh, not only of people in the present, in the recent past, but going way back. Yeah, um, I, I like that. I think it's, but it is sometimes kind of frustrating because you can't always get the real scoop. Um, in the same way, um, my solution to trying to broaden the base of my knowledge resources um, and, and heightening interest in the essay reading at the same time has been to, to integrate quotations into the historical essays from those same oral history interviews. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of it because I think it makes the point. You have to put this stuff down. You, can, you don't want to distort it. Um, Randy just said, I think you could paraphrase some quotes a little bit more. I'll take that on. Uh, take his wise counsel, um, but you have to have that kind of sometimes dry history there. Um, so I'm going to quote, I'm going to read you a little bit of the early essay, early part of the essay, having to do with prehistory and the Indians in this region. Got a lot of good stuff from Randy's book. Um, and then I'm going to, to read you what I've added of Eric White's interview in, to integrate that. I know a lot of you know Eric. He is just a wonderful fellow. He's so gifted. He's a retired game warden. He's written his own book and a beautiful article about his father some years ago in Downey's Magazine, a real treasure. He, he's composed music. He builds musical instruments. And last but not least, he is a real, um, uh, he's passionate about Indian artifacts. In fact, he told me that he, first got interested when he and his dad were out west um, in one of one of the ski areas that Chummy Broomhall, our own Rumford boy, was laying out out there and they went out to visit and he found his first Indian artifacts. So that's the background here. So bear with me because this is the stuff that you would read, but you might read faster. By This is about the, the Native Americans. By 1600 AD, some 5,000 Indians, according to Randall Bennett, lived in Maine. Louise Dickinson Rich, however, doubted that Maine's harsh environment could have supported more than 3,000 Indians at any one time. The Indians had settlements where they raised corn, but they traveled, moving back and forth from their coastal residences to the interior of western Maine. Traveling in small bands, they hunted in the winter, fished in the rivers and streams in the spring. Those who traveled along the Androscoggin and through Rumford were Abenaki Indians related to the Algonquins, who occupied the American East from North Carolina north to Newfoundland. When the first settler arrived in Rumford Corner, a few Abenakis remained in the region, but they were driven back into Canada after a last attack on settlers in neighboring Bethel. Traces of the Abenakis remain, and this is real interesting, to me anyway. Um, recent <clears throat> Recent archaeological work sponsored by the Maine Historical Preservation Commission suggests that the Androscoggin at Rumford was a stopping place for people of the early archaic, middle archaic, and late ceramic periods. Now, that's interesting, but it's going to get a lot more fun when Eric starts talking, he says, of the Abenakis. 
the river was their turnpike. And they traveled up and down through here to and from the coast. They lived up to Rangeley, Omega, Richardson, Musul during the summers. They stopped there with a dugout or with a birch canoe. Most of the artifacts that you find of the so-called woodland ceramic period, this is still Eric, are made of Mount Jasper rhyolite. You can even spell that. Uh, that's in Berlin. That's in Berlin. So they were getting away a little farther. After a while, says Eric, you get to sense what the Indians look for. If you or I were canoeing and we wanted to stay overnight and went by a nice level looking place up away from the river, or maybe there was a nice little cold brook, the Indians look for the same things that you and I would look for. Some place where the sun shone with the southeast exposure. Isn't that better now? <laughs> um, I've also turned to other than Rumford histories as sources for these essays. Randy's work um, is among these, and so are some, I think, rather surprising ones. Louise Dickinson Rich wrote a darling article about Rumford Point and Woman's Day back in 1946. I've also used a book called State Domain by Louise Dickinson Rich. I have a little piece from Field and Stream magazine, and a wonderful book that I, I mentioned to you earlier by a fellow called Robert Pike, um, Robert L. Pike, I think it is, who wrote about the logging camps and lumbering. His book, uh, one of several, was it dates back to the 1960s, and it's called Tall Trees, Tough Men. It's just a wonderful book. And I've also worked with such items as an unpublished paper on food preservation between 1850 and 1950, written by Pan Patty Henner, who's at the Maine State Library. And there's other stuff. So I've tried to reach out. I, here's something I, I bring to you, because I think it's relevant not only to what I've been trying to do, but to what you all are doing here. Uh, one of the first books that was recommended to me and by um, the history scholar for the project. It's called <clears throat> Maine, the Pine Tree State from Prehistory to the Present. It's a big old book. And it contains, oh, dozens of essays. It's divided into agriculture and industry and so on, things you would expect. Although, I noticed it too is very low in information about just regular living and women, but never mind. What really struck me about it is that there is almost nothing in the book about Western Maine. Almost nothing. A few references to Bethel and to Oxford County. And here's the one on Rumford. And it's on like page 496 in the arts section. And that mentions that in Rumford, this is all it says in part of the sense, in Rumford is the artist family Wardwell. That's Rumford in the whole book. So I think the work you're doing here, you know, takes <coughs> even deeper meaning because when you try to find out from, from larger sources, there's not as much there as there ought to be. I mentioned that. Another challenge, which I've several times mentioned, is the absence of information from women who lived in Rumford over centuries and about them. I was further struck by that. Um, my, this wonderful history project advisor to the to us is Polly Kaufman. She's written a lot of books on women, especially women teachers and women of the West. And a recent one is called, I love this name, a Pop, Apron Full of Gold. It is the second edition done by Polly after an earlier edition done by an M-A-N of the letters of Mary Jane, I'm sure I butchered this name, Mekier, uh, letters that she wrote from San Francisco back home to her children whom she had left behind to join her husband in the gold rush. And the first edition, Polly points out in her introduction, that the editor took out any references to her feelings, to her concerns about her children, to food, to how they live. Polly put them back in, and it makes a much better book. Um, without a lot more time on this, on this book, and I can spend <coughs> several more years to good purpose, I don't think I can address this one fully. But, I did get lucky um, with one item which has to serve a lot of purposes, and that is um, excerpts that Stuart Martin took from the diary of Kate Kimball Blanchard. And those excerpts covered the period 1865 to 1866. And I've used them a couple of places in the book, but in the section called Everyday Life, 
I was particularly interested to include because it's about her courtship and marriage entrance entries that I I'd, I'd like to share a few of them with because they they just are so eloquent they're very they're cryptic but they tell a lot so so listen she's gonna she knows she's gonna marry Orlando Blanchard but oh what mixed feelings she has and she calls him by the way variously Blanche Orlando I think that depends on her mood um, and B. And this isn't long, but it'll give you a good idea, and it's, it's from the book. May 16, 1866, this is. Orlando came down and assisted me in setting out my plants. I hope they will live, especially the grapevine, for that is his. May 25th, B says we shall have the best house in town. I wish he would think of something else. <laughs> it's really dear. May 17th. Orlando wants the marriage to take place the 7th of July, but the thought of marriage. May 29th. Oh dear, I wish someone would tell me what to do. How can I ask anyone's advice? I must ask my mother, but I do so dread it. May 31st. Getting married, or the thought of it, makes me sick when I'd rather study and practice music and drawing as my heart dictates. But it's my own fault. I ought to have thought of this before. Mother says I have seen my best days, and I believe it is so. <laughs> <laughs> June 1st, she's been out on a, a buggy ride with Blanche. And she says, I never was tired of riding with him yet. June 2nd. I could not muster the courage to broach the subject to Mother. And of course, I could not dots without darling Blanche. <laughs> Will he not think me a heartless little good-for-nothing? June 5th. I rejoice to think that a decision has been made, although I may regret the step before it is taken. June 7th. Called in to see Euthal, E-U-T-H-A-L, Euthalia, maybe. Helen was there, reciting in French. I would like very much to study with her, but cannot now, June 24th, have never seen quite so much love in Orlando's face. July 1st, this one is so gripping. I must write for the last time while I remain in girlhood. <laughs> My darling Orlando, he loves me, he says. July 2nd, I just pay special attention to this one, see if you think what I think about it. July 2nd, started for Norway about 7 in the morning. Got out there about 11. The Reverend Gunnison being gone, we were obliged to wait till 4. I managed to live through it. Started directly for Lovell. They got married that day. <laughs> <laughs> and no one went with them. Isn't that interesting? And last but not least, do you really think she made a diary entry on her wedding night? It's very interesting to think about. <laughs> um, <laughs> July 7th. Now, this is really interesting, too. And I think this was not uncommon uh, in the 18th and much of the 19th century. July 7th. Orlando is coming here to board because, see, their house was not finished. And so she got back from her wedding trip and went right back home to her own bedroom. Orlando is coming here to board. I'm glad, after all, that I consented to be married so soon, so he can come here, and I can be better than I have. Or at least, I must try and be a good little girl. July 8th, the first Sunday night of married life, and a happy one. July 9th, this is the last one. My Orlando has left me for the first time. We have been married one week, and he went to Paris this morning. How lonely. <laughs> now, now, back to my other notes. I want you to keep in mind, this was a courtship and wedding in 1866. And when I read you a little something from one of the oral history interview stories, it's about another wedding. Okay. I worked very hard on the essays for Rumford's stories. And I, want, I constantly need to remind 
all of us that this is really an oral history. That's the main point of it. Uh, the 71 subjects I include in the exhibit in the book, most any one of them, we could write a whole book about. Some of them just stunning stories, adventures, oh, courage, all kinds of things. Their lives and family histories and reflections are fascinating. Often they're very funny and wise. I'd like to close this evening, and I'm really glad for any questions or comments you have, by reading from one of my favorite romantic stories. This is the story, and I'm not going to read all of it. Uh, this is the story of Cindy and Scott Forsett. They're a young couple, they seem very young to me, but they're in their 30s. They have two children whom they adore. They love being in Rumford. Rumford. Uh, they're grateful to be near their parents and all their extended family, siblings and cousins. They work hard. Uh, several, well, Cindy's at home with the kids during the day, but she helps Scott when he does DJing and his magic shows, which are quite good. They live in the Sticky Town section of Rumford, once known, I regret to say, as McGregorville. <laughs> Talk about that one later. No, we're like a one. Here we go. Scott and Cindy were set. <clears throat> Cindy says, Oh, we had a huge wedding. Over 300 people. The biggest hall we could get. The year we got married, the eagles burned, the barn board burned, and we ended up having it at the American Legion. My guest list was up to about 400 something. Mm -hmm. My mother comes from a family of nine, and my father from a family of eight. A lot of cousins, they're close, so I couldn't leave them out. We're Catholic, so we got married in St. John's because we needed a big church. I wanted a huge aisle to walk down. I just wanted to shine. It was a fairy tale wedding. Scott. She got left at the hall at the end of the night. This is after the reception. I ended up jumping in a car with my cousins going off to go swimming at Toast. The whole reception, she was talking to everybody all over the place. I was just on the dance floor the whole time. She was like on her own anyway. <laughs> he says, I'm going to take off. I said, no problem. I'll ride with my mother. <laughs> my father says, I'm going to take off. My mother says, okay, I'll ride with Cindy. Everybody left. I said, uh, where'd you park? She goes, I don't have a car. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She says, you don't have a car either, do you? I said, no. The guy in the <laughs> hall had locked up, though he asked if they were all right before he left. They said, sure. I'm in my wedding dress, and my mother's all dressed up. They're not going to forget us. Well, we waited and waited and waited. Finally, we started, decided to start walking. Someone was going to come. Neither of us had any money. So we're walking downtown over the Memorial Bridge, arm in arm, cars going by. Everybody knew who I was. Everybody waved. Nobody stopped. <laughs> but it was special. I'm really glad I had that time with my mother. <laughs> I'll just read a little bit because um, Scott and Cindy come from two very cult different cultural backgrounds, French and Italian, and you know, one of the, the most amazing learnings for me, because we were, all the time we visited here over the years, we were out in Rumford Point. You didn't, I didn't get it. Rumford is so diverse culturally and so interesting and has become so rich on that account. So this is a little bit about family life and tradition, very little. Scott, <clears throat> both sides of my family are French. We lived in Wilton in Mexico and ended up living in Rumford. My parents owned this apartment building. And when Cindy, when Cindy and I moved here, I had deja vu. I bought it from my mother. My mother built a house up the street. I moved down here, and my brother moved across the street. Sticky Town, that's what we call it. That's something, too, having all this family so close. For me, uh, from where I come from, it's just, just magical. Cindy says, my father's Italian, my mother's French, so, and she said this, so I'm a walked frog. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a walked frog, or a frog walk, depending on which grandmother teases us. <laughs> Scott goes on, 
You know that tra what tradition was passed down by my family? He's French, remember. My father's Aunt Irene, such a small world it is, was real close friends with Cindy's grandmother. I grew up with the same spaghetti sauce. They shared the recipe back 50 years ago. You know how you go to somebody else's house, it always tastes so different? Spaghetti sauce at their house was the same. Cindy, it takes a long time she needs to make spaghetti sauce. There's a lot of frying involved. Fry the onions, green peppers, and sausage, and pepperoni. You've got to fry that all separate. The secret's not to quite burn it, but it has to be so that you can't really see the onions or green peppers. Then you have to fry the paste, so it takes a while to make it. My father taught me, and he learned from his mom. We have one tradition, because my dad's Italian, and he's family. We had to promise that we would sleep over every Christmas Eve that we would go up to his house and spend the night. My kids have never had Christmas anywhere else but my father's house. I make the sauce and bring up the sauce and meatballs. Everybody brings their kids and families and we eat and eat and eat. This Christmas we got matching pajamas, tweety pajamas. It was magic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad to take questions. <laughs> Stan both and thank Randy for his promotion of the book. I'll tell you something, we closed down the $5 discount, I don't know, some weeks ago. But if you were to fill out that order form, mail it in, and write Bethel Historical Society on it, you still get the discount. <laughs> <laughs>